This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Jay-Z Microphones, Presonus, Spectra 1964, and API Audio. So get ready to rock. There are loads of great statement reverbs. I mean, it's so easy to find freeware spring emulations and strange little uh, old fashioned style plate reverby kind of things. That stuff's pretty easy to find and you're less concerned if it sounds unnatural and how it sounds unnatural because you'll EQ it a lot anyway and you'll, it'll be an effect in its own right. It's where it has to sound natural that it's really difficult. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. If you feel like the fast pace of computer tech has made your studio Mac obsolete, then think again. OWC is your personal studio tech for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and use Macs perfect for recording and mixing. Why ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio far into the future with the Mac you've already got? Learn how to supercharge your studio and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC.com so that you can focus on making great music. If you want a digital audio workstation that will give life to your music from sketching a new idea to composing, editing, mixing, and mastering a finished record, then you want Studio One from Presonus. Studio One is easy to use with intuitive drag and drop simplicity, making it great for beginners, yet flexible and powerful for experienced producers. Whether creating beats, recording a band, or composing a blockbuster film soundtrack, you will find everything you need to create your masterpiece. Download your free version of Studio One Prime and get started now at Presonus, wherever sound takes you. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Mike Sr., a professional recording mixing engineer teacher, and writer for years at Sound on Sound magazine. He's also the author of the popular books Mixing Secrets for the Small Studio and its sequel, Recording Secrets for the Small Studio. Mike was on the podcast back on episode 124 when we got the story of his start in audio and also talked about the importance of making mistakes in the studio. He shared lots of tips for recording drums, bass, guitars, and vocals, and even talked about various methods for setting up mics for stereo recording. In fact, there's some pretty amazing photos in the blog post. Today, though, we're going to focus on mixing. So Mike has recently issued a new edition of his book, um, Mixing Secrets for the Small Studio, and he has put together a wonderful list of tools and software that we can use to get a pro mix in your studio and not the expensive kind either. In fact, Mike has recently put this list together of his favorite freeware that you can find and download from anywhere right now. So if you're on a budget for your studio, but you still want to make your mixes sound awesome, then you're going to want to listen to this episode. Please welcome Mike Sr. to Recording Studio Rockstars. Mike, are you ready to rock, 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 rock? Oh, I'm, I'm totally... Channeling ACDC. <laughs> Good, I'm back in black. <laughs> oh, my God. Talk about a great sounding record. Oh, that is just a fabulous sounding record. Uh, how, oh, yeah. How much of that record do you think has to do with the mix versus the recording? Um, Quite a lot of it, but also just the way it was recorded was great. In fact, um, when I first started uh, recording... Um, or when I first started uh, working in studios, um, I I did some uh, assisting for Tony Platt, who was the engineer on that record. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, and and yeah, he was saying that some of the sound was the sound of the recording, and some of the sound was dealing with the fact that it was recorded a certain way and making it sound like big like that. And they did kind of various strange kind of send things on the snare and. Yeah, it's really, really cool. The other thing I like about that record is the fact that the snare is always tuned to the um, key of the track. It's a really oh, good example really? of that. Oh, that's great yeah, to and know. It, and it's a really good, if you, want to, if you want to show people what it does to a track when you tune the snare to the, tra to the key of the track, that's a really good example of it. I mean, those drums are just, they're epic. They're, they're iconic. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah. They, they're sort of an example of what you go listen to and you're like, man, I got to remember what huge drums sound like. Um, and yeah. it's funny because they might not sound huge against a modern drum sound in a, in a different kind of genre, but um, or they may just sound different. But the experience of listening to them when you're not sort of cross comparing and you're just you're just in that record, it's just so perfect, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that used to be something that would be in my um, kind of mixed reference collection. Yeah, and and I, I guess not knowing the story of how those drums were recorded and mixed. Um, if you want to share anything you know about it, that'd be great. But also, um, I, I feel like m I had this gut sense that like, oh, did they do some cool trick? You know, did they use samples for the first time or something like that? Just because they're so spot on. What do you know about that? That question. Um, from from memory, um, there was a, um, a lot of that recording was done in a very dry room. If I'm remembering remembering correctly, because because the, the thing is, he did Highway to Hell and he did um, Back in Black, mm -hmm. and um, I, I seem to remember him talking about the issue that it was recorded in a very dead space, and so what he had to do then was run the drums out into a space and like create artificial like reverb and stuff after the fact to glue the whole thing back together again. Oh, cool! Because it was all too it was all too separate. Well, they're so consistent sounding too. It's just like the kicks and the oh, snares yeah. are just like they ne they're I mean, never that, lacking. And the, but you see that is all Mutt Lang and Mutt Lang's profession, professionalism or a kind of um, uh, attention to detail. Just you know, endless takes and editing to get it absolutely fat and consistent every time. I mean that you're hearing Mutt Lang as a producer there in that yeah. respect. Yeah. Do you think that they were messing around with um, you know like looping sections of the drums or anything? On to that build up? record, I don't think they were. Um, I mean, he got into a lot of sampling later, but I don't think I don't think they triggered samples on that record yet. I think it was a bit too early because the AMS units that were the first ones that really brought that into yeah. the mainstream were really, I think, beginning of eighties, and that was just at the end of the seventies. That was, was like just the, before that. The um, the reverb unit, right? Well, no. The, uh, well, there were two. You see, there was the uh, there was the AMX RMX sixteen. That's the one that you associate with the big kind of garden gnome sneezing into a sheet of tinfoil snare drum sound. <laughs> and, 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 and then there was the delay unit that was a, officially a dual delay, but it gave rise to two different very important effects for the 80s. One was the classic harmonizer effect because you could pitch shift the delay and slightly change the delay settings to create that kind of Chicago detune effect. Mm-hmm. And the other one was that you could, there was a kind of a, I think a, a later mod for it that allowed you to use its delay memory as a sampler and then trigger whatever sample you'd captured into it from an audio trigger signal. Now that's what so I could, remember because we mixed a yeah. record with Ben Gross at the mix room in LA and that's how he was playing back the samples. In fact, he preferred that over trying to do anything straight out of Pro Tools. Um, yeah. He yeah. was just triggering, you know, because he had his way of doing it and it worked. Yeah, yeah. And apparently and course, they were very quick. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's the whole... I mean, you know, all these kind of developments that we think of as being quite recent, a lot of them were happening a long time before you think they were. Like, uh, things like um, all this kind of editing and auto-tuning of vocals. We yeah. think about that as being like the birth of auto-tune in the mid-90s. Mm -hmm. But actually, they were already doing that well back into the 80s using the old Sony digital tape machines. And bouncing things between different tracks is an engineer called David Wrightsus, who did lots of work for people like Barbara Streisand and Whitney Houston and stuff. And a lot of those stuff, a lot of that stuff from the eighties that you think couldn't have been auto-tuned was actually edited to death. Ooh, fascinating! So now I remember being in the studio and we rented an Eventide H three thousand for a session. Yep. Just so that we could take a couple of vocal phrases and send it over and pitch shift it slightly and bring it back in on an ADAT. But you're saying that using the Sony digital machines, they were tuning. Was it probably similar? Were they just bouncing stuff from one track to another through a little bit of a pitch shift each time? Well, I think I think you could actually do it within the tape machine. I think there was some like really. I mean, because Dave writes us was really familiar with the way those machines worked and knew all the little internal parameters and stuff. And I think there was a way you could do it within the machine. In fact, talking about the Eventide Harmonizer, I seem to remember hearing about a mod that someone did that enabled you to, to send a CV signal from 
mm-hmm. uh, one of the faders of an SSL console, you know, the automated faders, yeah. to trigger the pitch shifting of an eventide harmonizer. So you could automate the pitch shift of an eventide harmonizer using the SSL automation system. That's that's way more badass than what I was going to say was which the, I was going to say I had heard that they were able to MIDI control the pitch shift on it, but I like yours so much. It's so much cooler. Well, again, CD and it's all in that, it's all pre MIDI. I mean, MIDI was eighty two, eighty three, right? And you get all that stuff going on pre MIDI, and it totally was happening. That's such a trick. and that's and that's not even taking into account all the massively <laughs> just crazy editing that would go on as well. I love it. So here's a good question for you. What does any of this have to do with freeware? That's my question to both <laughs> of us, right? <laughs> um, oh, crap. Well, we How started we by there? talking about great sounding records, you know, and great sounds. Yes. Um, you know, uh, oh, I made the mistake of mentioning, mentioning ACDC. That was it. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's enough it's to get any engineer slope. off on a tangent. <laughs> yeah. Back in black and, and you're done for, right? So. Yeah. Uh, let's talk. Let's jump back on topic here. Um, you yeah. put together. Well, first of all, you've written a great book. Tell us about this book that you've written and why it is that you. you've come out with a new collection of freeware to share with us. Well, the book, the original first edition of the book, was written about almost ten years ago now. And then a couple of years after I'd written the book, I started putting together this resources website alongside it, just really to add updates and things and add little extra resources to the book for the reading and links to freeware plugins. Okay, but because I was big let, on let's get the let's throw the name of the book in there again because somebody's going to be hearing yeah, this and not not knowing it. It was about it. Mixing Secrets, Mixing Secrets for the Small Studio. Indeed. And it's basically a step-by-step mixing primer. You you kind of you can start at the beginning and work through your mix alongside the chapters of the book until you get to the end of the book and you've completed your mix. It gives you it gives a kind of a structured way of learning how to mix in the first instance. I mean, obviously, no one mixes like that after they've learned how to mix, but it's a way of kind of breaking it down into manageable chunks so that you can kind of learn how all the different processes work and they fit together. I, I would almost uh, disagree and say that um, at the more pro we become at mixing the more we sort of embrace the step-by-steps, we just maybe come up with our own versions of them at some point. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And I think you, you begin to get a bit more of a freestyle attitude to it. You you follow the the call of the music rather than thinking, oh, I have to do this first and then I have to do this and then I have to do this. Right, exactly. Um, but exactly. it's such a big task that I think when people are starting off, they just don't know where to start with stuff. They don't know how to get the basics right before they start jumping into the stuff that's more complicated in advance before they've got the best out of the the, the more basic stuff. So, yeah, it was just a way I wanted to kind of structure the mixing process to help people just learn about it. Um, Following on from my kind of um, experience doing mixed rescues and seeing people just kind of getting the wrong end of the stick with the the process. Yeah, and you know what, give us us an introduction to what the mixed rescue is too, because that's a cool thing that you've done. Well, um, it was uh, when I worked at Sound on Sound back in uh, the early 2000s, um, I started, I kind of commissioned an article series where... Um, a reader would send in a mix that they were having trouble getting a commercial result with. And then they'd send us the multi-tracks of that mix too. We'd send it off to one of our contributors who would then remix the track to get the commercial result that the reader was looking for and write about the process and why the original mix hadn't done the job and how you know the, the mix had been changed to make it so that it, it produced the result that the reader was after. That's great. Um, and, then, and then when I left the magazine... I ended up writing a lot of those articles. I mean, I think I've written more than 60 of those now. Where I, and basically you do a mix and then you write about it and you you say how you've how you've sorted out whatever problems they were they were encountering on the encountering when they did the mix the first time. That's and the awesome. book kind of came out of that. It was just trying to point out the the things that people tended to be coming unstuck with when they were trying to mix it for themselves. Yeah, I'm sure there were probably some very similar uh, commonalities between you know different struggles with mixes, some basic yeah. elements that just sort of need to be addressed almost every time. Yeah, and and the the resources then that I created on the website, a lot of those are drawn then from the audio examples I did for Mix Rescue because the whole thing about Mix Rescue was that it was meant to be audio example driven. You know, there's no point in mixing something and saying, well, this is definitely better, and then it's like, why should we believe that? <laughs> to show us something that we can listen to that proves that you've made it better. I know that's um, one of the challenges about yeah. talk. It, it, uh, gosh, who was the quote? She said, "It's like dancing about architecture." That was a yeah. quote that I've heard before. <laughs> Indeed, it's hard to talk about audio. Sometimes you just got to yeah. hear it. You know, yeah, yeah. And that was certainly one of the big drives on my part for commissioning the mix rescue article in the first place, was because I just felt we were writing articles about mixing that there was no reason for anyone to believe us. 
other than just taking it on trust that we knew what we were talking about. Yeah. Whereas with Mixed Rescue, you know, you hear what happens. And actually, if you don't like the mix at the end, then you can disregard the article. <laughs> nice. And so, nice. you know, um, well, that's we, good. Allow, we allow that as a possibility. And, and Rockstars, of course, we'll have links to that in the show notes so you can just click through if you want to go check out any of um, Mike's work with Sound on Sound. You want the critical details from your microphone to get through to your recording, and the Spectra 1964-101 amplifier provides just that. With unequaled headroom, low noise, and a linear output, irrespective of transient audio peaks. Used by Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, Stack Studios, and The Record Plant on records by ZZ Top, Aerosmith, Bruce Springsteen, and John Lennon, Spectra 1964 brings that same incredible sound to your studio with the new STX-600 mic pre with built-in comp limiter. Start making classic records again at spectra1964.com. Are you sick of microphones that make your music sound harsh and brittle? The new Amethyst mic by Jay-Z Microphones brings you a rich, warm tone with perfect detail using the Golden Capsule technology. Resulting from 30 years of microphone design, the Amethyst is hand-built using carefully selected parts with Class A discrete circuitry, extremely low self-noise, and an advanced shock mount to make sure your recording sound awesome. This is my voice on the Amethyst right now. Use the limited-time coupon ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the Amethyst mic at jzmic.com. Now, you've, you've recently come out with a new version or a new edition, right? Yes. I mean, obviously, after like seven or eight years, the, the, the technology moves on, new tools become available. And also, I had loads of questions and feedback from the first edition of the book that I was getting repeatingly the same questions. So I, I figured, yeah, I might as well just incorporate those into a new edition of the book. And ended up, I mean, I must have added another like 20, 25% material to the, to the book for the second edition. Just updating old stuff. There were a couple of chapters I completely rewrote, added a whole bunch of stuff about master bus processing and about you know, the role of mastering in the, in the, in the kind of project studio mixing process. Um, kind of more advanced processes that hadn't really existed when I originally wrote the book. Um, all that stuff I was then able to kind of add in. Yeah, absolutely. And I imagine some things, you know, there might have been a rule way back, which was like, hey, by the way, never do this with your email and sending this file. And now it's like, absolutely do this with your email and sending this file. Because the technology just changed. Like, what you can take for granted today is totally different. Um, yes. Although it was interesting because it surprised me how much of it still held, that the basic fundamentals of how to mix something haven't changed much even in 10 years. Yeah, well, where should we begin? Well, uh, that's a good question. I mean, I, I've I've got various kind of categories of, of, of freeware I, I could talk about, but I, I wonder whether maybe it would be best just for me to point out ones that I thought were particularly kind of standout bits of freeware in that aren't in a particular character, particular, particular manufacturers of freeware that that do really good things. Absolutely. And then uh, maybe we want to preface this too by explaining, you know, freeware rock stars essentially just means free plugins you can download. Um, yeah. And, and I don't know if it's beyond plugins, if you have some other stuff you want to share too. It's mostly, it's mostly plugins in this situation. That's most of the situation, that the, the people, that's most of the kind of thing that people are looking for when they're looking for freeware in relation to mixing. And I mean, the reason why I went into all this freeware stuff is that the book is all about small studio users. And I wanted to try to make um, all this mixing capability as accessible as possible to people with the lowest budget as possible. Mm -hmm. And part of that is saying that, actually, I think you can do perfectly good professional mixes entirely with freeware. In fact, I've demonstrated it in the mag several times. In fact, even, I think, in the current edition of Sound on Sound Mag is a mixed rescue of mine done entirely with freeware and with bundled plugins in, in Pro Tools. Yeah, and I think that's really awesome. You know, I, I have a, a free program as well that uh, called the Mix Master Bundle, which just yeah. shows how to do stuff with freeware. I may need to go back and double check that, that uh, <laughs> everything's still there. I, I'm pretty sure it is. But, um, you know, I imagine you probably get people asking you that question. It's like, can you really do, like, don't you have to go buy expensive stuff in order to get a pro sound in, in making records? Mm. And, and, I, and I basically... I, I basically just point to the results. I say, well, is that good enough? Yeah. And if you, can, if you can get a mix entirely with freeware and they go, yeah, yeah, that's good enough, I'd be happy to get that result, then it, it proves the point. 
and I mean, apart yeah. from anything, there are loads of people who are who've gone on record as saying it doesn't matter what kit you use, <laughs> and it really doesn't in some respects, particularly now. I mean, there was quite a lot of dodgy freeware about ten years ago, and there was some good freeware, but now there is so much good freeware, it's ridiculous, and also very advanced freeware as well, really powerful freeware tools. It used to be that there were certain specialist things that you couldn't get in freeware form, which now you can. And yeah, I mean, that's really impressive. Okay, cool. Awesome. And Rockstars, in case you were wondering, dodgy means bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've, we have simultaneous translation here. That's all right. That's my, that's my job, man. That's my job. No, I love it. All right. So uh, let's see. What's the, what's the first uh, thing you want to recommend? Okay, right. Uh, the first uh, kind of manufacturer or developer of, um, manufacturer seems a strange name for it, developer of freeware that I would definitely recommend checking out is a, is a company called Tokyo Dawn Records. Nice. And they have three freeware plugins that are all really, really good. Um, probably top of my list would be one called TDR Nova, which is... Probably, which is, which is certainly the best freeware dynamic equalizer that I know of. And that used to be a, a, a type of processor that was just not accessible in freeware form. Yeah, absolutely. Whereas I mean, now... I thought I only heard about it with the newer paid plugins, so that's very exciting. Yeah, it's very, very powerful, very good at what it does, and yeah, very easy to use. Also in the Tokyo Dawn list, there's um, TDR Kotelnikov. It's a rather long name, but it's basically a compressor. But it's a compressor that has that slightly m kind of magical ability of compressing invisibly. Because it has a kind of a dual compressor in it. It compresses the peaks independently of the um, RMS amount. And you can, ah. you can um, decide how much of each of those two compressor elements you use. And there are all sorts of like whizzy extra features in there for like side chaining. And it's really, really cool the way it works. And it's, it's just the perfect transparent compressor. You know, if you've got a lot of game reduction to do and you don't want to hear it happening, that is pretty much a go-to compressor for it. But yeah. I use that often over payware plugins. So now what's the name of that plugin again? It's Kotelnikov. Oh my God, how <laughs> do I spell thing, that? Honestly, the best thing... <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll, we'll put like a list of um, links in the show notes so that people can find the right things. But the easiest way to find it is go, just go to the Tokyo Dawn website and look through the list and it's one of the few that they have there. All right, I just wrote down something that looks like Russian, so... Yeah, I'll, it does I'll look a bit like close. that. Yeah. Okay, very cool. I love that. And, you know, um, one of the hardware units that I've been talking about, about a lot here at the studio is the uh, mm. comp limiter from Spectra 1964, which right. has a, a particularly, you know, unique limiting feature and then compression. It's almost like a reverse order than what I'm used oh, to. Oh, wow. Cool. Um, so what you're talking about sounds sounds like it'd be pretty intriguing to see how that works. And And the cool thing is, like, you know, if you get the limiting sorted out, it really lets you bring up the overall gain of the of the track, mm. um, and bring it forward more, uh, and, and without in a way getting that's those kind pumpy, of weird you know? game pumping artifacts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's and certainly the, the idea of series compression compression like that is very powerful, and they just implement it in a really elegant way in this particular plugin. Okay, great. Um, and then you said there was a third one from Tokyo. Well, Dawn. there's another one called VOS Slick EQ which is just a, a kind of a fairly feature-restricted in a kind of a usability way. You know, there's a high band, a mid band, and a low band, and there's not kind of loads of frills, but again, it's really elegantly done, and there are models of various different EQ curves in it, and there's some saturation. So this kind of got useful stuff in there, and it's very straightforward to use and quite kind of uncluttered. It doesn't, it's not like a zillion different um, options there available to, to you. you know, I mean, it's not my, it's not my favorite EQ, but it's it's a good EQ. Yeah. It's the other two plugins though that are the real showstoppers. Yeah, no, but I like that. I remember um, I spent a lot, long time mixing with three band EQs uh, when I was starting, probably more than I do now. One of the things I really liked about it is it let me focus a little bit more on some musical decisions and not get too stuck on trying yeah. to like you know. Yeah. It's like yeah. you know when you're when you're especially when you're sort of getting comfortable with mixing. It's like you don't really want to be given the the surgery room just yet. You know, you don't want to be given a surgery's, yeah. surgeon's yeah. outfit yeah. and all the scalpels 
because you're going to, yeah. somebody's not going to look too good when they come out of the operating room. You know what I mean? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you want something that's going to do musical stuff rather than doing anything too kind of surgical that you can, it doesn't give you so much rope you can hang yourself with it. Exactly. So it's nice to just have like, you know, some some good choices for high end, mids and lows and just start with yeah. that and, you know, kind of coax the tracks around a little bit. But actually, my my um, better recommendations for that kind of concept of EQ, there are a couple of them. There's one from a company called LKJB, I think, called Lufticus. And that's just a kind of preset frequencies, like five bands, but it's all really nice sounding. And another one from Sonimus called Sony Q. And both of those are ones that are clearly designed for that musical attitude and kind of character attitude to EQ rather than, you know, picking out little masking frequencies and stuff. Okay, very so cool. If you want are those both EQ, um, freeware as well? Or they're those... both freeware. And, and in fact, um, unless I say otherwise, all this stuff is also cross-platform and 64-bit. That was one of the big things that I did when I went through to update the freeware stuff was just checking like what it's compatible with and, and, and what's, what, whether it's kind of the, the latest um, resolution. Okay, Greery. Well, so that actually takes me back to a question I meant to ask earlier, which is, um, mm. you know, which DAW are we talking about and does that even matter? It doesn't really matter because there are now so many utilities that allow you to um, bridge things between different formats. I mean, if you're using like VST or AU, you can pretty much bridge to or from them. And say with Artas, to pretty much any from from pretty much any format to any to any other format using something like um, DDMF's Meta plugin, for example, or um, oh, what's the other one? Off the top of my head, I can't. Think. Oh yeah, this J Bridge that will take um, uh, is it? Yeah, we'll take like PC plugins and 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 also no thirty two bit plugins and and bridge them over to sixty four bit. Um, there's thirty two lives from uh, Sound Radix that will do a similar thing. Uh, DDMFs Bridgewise. These are all things that allow you to basically host um, plugins of one format within a plugin of another format. That's awesome, dude. You are you are just a fountain of detailed information. It's pretty amazing. So yeah, so basically, and the, and actually, this whole issue of of using plugins that are a bit out of date still holds because there are still some really good. Legacy plugins, particularly, I'm thinking of uh, a whole set of plugins from a company called Variety of Sound. Oh, very cool. Um, they have a whole suite of 32 bit, uh, 32 bit VST Windows plugins. But if you've got a bridging application and you can use them on your on your Mac system, they're actually really, really good plugins. Still, the the, the audio kind of processing quality and the character of them is is great. That's cool. I, I've never even heard of Variety of Sound and uh, DTMF. And what was it, LKJB and Tokyo Don? These are all brand new to me, so that's pretty yep. exciting stuff. And, and in fact, L LKJB, uh, there's another special thing to say about them, which is that um, I've looked around for a long time for a freeware linear phase EQ, and they have one called Q-Range. Okay. That's, again, a really cool EQ and linear phase. So if you need linear phase processing for any particular reason, that's a, a freeware option, with, and they're pretty... Difficult to find otherwise. Well, so Fox I, I want to dig graphic. in a little bit more um, so that people know what we're, why we're referring to all these different things. So mm. let, let's start with the um, the linear phase EQ. What are yeah. some What are some use cases where the rock stars should be aware? Like, oh, this might be a good time for you to try a linear phase EQ. The first kind of situation where I can imagine myself using a linear phase EQ is if I'm doing some kind of parallel processing because there are some EQs, I've had a lot of EQs that will change the phase response of the audio, the phase of different frequencies against each other, as well as changing the frequency response. And so if you're doing any kind of parallel processing and you EQ the parallel channel, you begin to get phase changes and not just frequency changes. Oh, that's so, so, great the, tip, the, man. so the EQ that you apply doesn't respond as you'd expect it to. Yeah, so and you've got your parallel processing going on. Like you've got your drums hitting the bus, but then you've also got this compressed drums coming up parallel, and you're also mm. EQing the compressed drums. That's where yeah. the EQ will start to phase shift as you adjust the EQ, and it's going yeah, to mess up the sound. Yeah. Some people like using linear phase EQ if they're going to do a lot of very uh, like surgical EQ on a on a on a track, you know, if they can do lots of little notches, like for example, you have lots of resonances on your snare drum or something, you want to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. um, some people like using linear phase EQ for that. You have to be a little bit careful for the one main side effect of using linear phase EQ though in that application, which is that you can get something called pre-ringing, which is a slightly weird effect that 
in practice sounds a little bit like the thing's been pitch shifted when it hasn't. It has that slightly digital gargly thing going on slightly before each hit. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to be a little bit careful for that. Um, a lot of people like using linear phase EQ for like mastering situations right. where they want literally they just want to change the frequency response without changing anything else about the sound. Yeah, so linear phase EQs, you, you would describe those as ones that don't add character. Yes, in a way. They don't add that phase change right. that you would expect with an analog EQ. N now, does this also mean that when we use them, we're likely to push things a little further because we're not sure if we're hearing a change? If we're not, you know, if our ear is less trained? You might, you might do. Um, that's not really been, I've not really noticed that myself. Okay, all right. Yeah, I mean, I tend only to use linear phase. I tend, if I'm using linear phase as a kind of a mastering um, stage thing, small EQ changes always make a big difference when you apply them to a whole mix. Mm -hmm. So it's usually pretty easy to hear what's going on. Yeah, I mean, I often use the T-Rex linear phase um, EQ when I'm, when I'm doing kind of bus processing for that reason. Right, okay, cool. If you're ready to upgrade your studio to the famous sound of API's large format consoles, then you're ready for The Box, a small format console featuring the same analog circuitry and original 2520 op amp design that has made API famous for 50 years. Record through eight world-class mic pre-channels, mix through 24 smooth-as-glass faders, and blend mics, analog effects, and parallel compression at the speed of electrons rather than the speed of your computer latency. Upgrade Upgrade your home studio to legendary status with The Box from apiaudio.com. All right, well, so let's let's rewind a little bit. One of the first things you recommended was a dynamic EQ from Tokyo Dawn. Yes. Now, why don't you yep. uh, hip us to what a dynamic EQ is? Now, um, there's a lot of similarity between a dynamic EQ and a multiband compressor, but basically the whole concept of, if you think of an EQ... Just a static EQ. You've got your bandwidth, you've got your um, uh, frequency, and you've got your gain control. Yeah. And if you think of the gain control now not being a gain control that you just grab a handle and turn it, but if you think of it as being the gain change processor of a compressor, say. Yeah. So that EQ band then begins to act like a compressor, and you can set its threshold and its ratio and its attack and release, just as if it were a compressor. But it's an EQ band rather than a full band processor. Yeah. And that's usually what you find yourself using a dynamic EQ for. I mean, dynamic, you can have different types of dynamic on some dynamic EQs, but it's compression that you'll get in TDR Nova, and that's the most, that's the most useful part of it. Yeah. And it's, yeah, so what's just a, really useful for troubleshooting. Yeah, what's a, what's a use case where you're like, why would you reach for that uh, dynamic EQ? Well, um, a good example would be, for example, on, um, on uh, a vocal where the vocalist is moving in relation to the mic and the amount of proximity effect is changing. Ah. So you can actually use a low-frequency shelf to compress the low frequencies of the vocal to even that out again. That's a hip use. I like that. Um, I think I've, I've often reached for it when something seems harsh to me and I'm trying to figure out how yes. I can manage a, a harshness or if an instrument hits certain notes and it gets harsh only in certain sections. Yeah, I find myself using it a lot on vocals. I mean, another one, in fact, exactly that, that situation of harshness is, is a very good example because you'll often find some vocalists who they'll, they'll start low in their register and they'll start um, not singing quite as loud and then they might start reaching the chorus and then they move up in register and they open up a bit and then on certain syllables you'll suddenly get like a, kind of a mid-range frequency coming out and making it sound really harsh. Right. But if you just try and EQ that out on the vocal as a whole... It makes the whole vocal sound not present enough. Yeah, I like it. You said you, you know they go up register and they start opening up a, a little bit. Yeah, and you wish. They and so wouldn't. you can just train an EQ <laughs> band. Yeah, you can just train an EQ band on that little frequency peak, and then when it comes along, it just dings it down whenever it, whenever it, it it threatens to to poke out and make the whole mix sound too harsh. Yeah, and then I guess you know another tip for that. Sometimes even when you try and do that, like trying to DS certain zones of a, uh, it's mm. kind of like a DSer. It's kind of like, oh, yes. I mean, it's like having a you bunch can of see DSers, a DSer right? as being a specialized dynamic EQ. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes you, can you DS try and you dial it EQ. in with the DSer and you like when you get enough, it's too, it's still too much because it 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 grabs other parts of the song that you wish it didn't. 
Um, and I guess yeah. in that situation, maybe you could just automate a bypass or something like that, right? Just have just keep dropping yeah. it in on certain phrases and words. Yeah. And I mean, as a kind of a bus processing or mastering application, if you have two warm sounding instruments, let's say you have uh, um, an acoustic piano and an electric guitar, both of which are quite warm in the low mid range, but they don't always play at the same time. So that either when they both play together, it sounds too woolly, mm -hmm. or they sound great together. And then when one of them's playing on its own, it sounds a bit thin. That's a situation where you can apply a dynamic EQ to the low mid range of the master bus. And it keeps the um, overall tonality of your mix more consistent in the low mid-range, whether both are playing or whether only one's playing. Yeah, you know, and that, that reminds me, I recently used a dynamic EQ in a situation where I had like a two mix and it was basically rap vocals and some stacked melodies mm. over the top of a two mix. And yeah. so I wanted the two mix to kind of be in your face, but during the vocal phrases, I just put, I put a dynamic EQ on the two mix in mid side mode, and then I I just simply found the frequencies where the body of the vocal was, so that it would just kind of yeah. push the mids and EQ it to make a little room for the vocals every time they came in, and that seemed to be yeah. really helpful. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, cool. Well, let's see. So then um, the other one was the compressor limiter, and then a three band, um, and I guess the bridge plugins. Do you want to explain a little bit further about how a bridge plugin might work so that people start? Because if you're not using one yet, you probably just don't even yeah. think about it. You know? it's, it's a question of, I mean, there are certain plugins that if you're running a 64-bit host, which most modern DAWs are, they'll run what are called 64-bit plugins, which are a certain kind of uh, processing depth within the plugin. Um, it, if you look back kind of five, 10 years, that um, processing depth was less because the computers really couldn't cope with the processing demands of yeah. the higher um, processing resolution. Um, and so the earlier 32-bit plugins um, on modern DAW platforms sometimes don't load because they, they don't recognize the format. So a bridging plugin or a bridging application um, will create a 64-bit plugin that you load into your 64-bit DAW. Mm -hmm. And then you load the 32-bit plugin into the, into the bridging plugin. Right. So you can still use your 32-bit plugin within the bridging plugin in a 64-bit door. It's like a wrapper. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly a wrapper. And in fact, wrappers, of course, are the, are the whole thing that you can use then to, you know, use VST plugins in an AU host or, you know, switch platforms, basically. Yeah, but not the kind of wrapper that rhymes words together. This is one that rhymes <laughs> plugins. It rhymes bit formats together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> All right, cool, awesome. Um, and I guess I guess that was my questions about the stuff you already mentioned. Shall we just mm, keep mm. Move, moving forward before we take yeah, a break? Yeah, definitely. Um, the uh, one of my favorite things that I found is actually a distortion plugin. Um, there are loads and loads and loads of freeware distortions. You you you're just drowning in them. And I've got loads of recommendations on the site, but the one that really stands out for me that I've found recently is from a company called Klanghelm. Yeah. And it's called IVGI2, IVGI2. And it's one of these um, distortion plugins that you can drive pretty much any way you like, and it's always going to sound rich and warm and nice. Right. It'll ne I, it I never sounds kind of edgy and horrible. It is fabulous. And furthermore, what I really like about it is that it runs really well as a parallel channel. You know, some distortion plugins, they do freaky stuff with the phasing at yeah. the same time. And so it then doesn't really combine with something if you try and use it as a parallel process. But with IFGI 2, you can run it as a parallel process. You can fuzz it as much as you like, create all the harmonics you like. You can kind of EQ those potentially with a linear phase EQ and then add just the distortion components you want back in with the whatever signal you're processing. Well, so, and that's such a powerful thing to be able to do. Now, did you, it sounds like you were pretty intentional about figuring out some of these benefits of these different freewares. So did you actually mm. go and like know that you, that parallel was going to be one of the failing points and go try out a bunch of different distortions and then, and then hear yeah. how effective this one was? Yeah, and basically I, I don't really like recommending stuff I haven't used or haven't tried. And so I just, I downloaded all these plugins, tried them out, decided which ones seemed to work, um, which ones kind of had strange like usability bugs or just felt like I wouldn't want to recommend them to, to someone else. Yeah. And just slowly kind of narrowed it down to the ones that I thought, yeah, these, these are all 
usable things that seem to provide their own unique character that something else doesn't, you know. Well, that's cool. So uh, tell us about some of the knobs in this uh, uh, IGV2. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I think it's, it's basically just a four-knob interface. It's got a couple of switches. And you, it's, it's, it's not a question as much of, I mean, it's got like drive and asymmetry and stuff, but you're not thinking so much, oh, I know what that knob does, no, what that does. There are a few enough controls that you can just twiddle them mm -hmm. until you hear something that begins to sound okay, and then you can EQ it and add just whichever frequencies of that distortion you want then back into what you're processing. And that's, to me, what makes it so powerful, that you can use it so easily in, in parallel and just add just those distortion components that you want. Because, I mean, let's say, uh, let's just take an example. If you're, if you're um, uh, you've got a vocal in a rock track. This is, this is the, the, one of the classic examples. You have a vocal that's trying to compete against distorted electric guitars, cymbals, um, and maybe like Hammond organ. All these things are competing in the mid-range yeah. for space in the mix. And they all mask the vocal and make the vocal sound dull. And if you just EQ the vocal, then the vocal begins to sound harsh when it starts cutting through and sibilant and horrible. Yeah. So what you could do is you can send from the vocal to a distortion, such as EFG2, push into that distortion to create distortion harmonics, EQ those distortion harmonics into the region where you want the vocal to cut through, so maybe you like your two to three kilohertz region, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And what you get is not just more of the harmonics that are in, in the vocal. <clears throat> you get denser harmonics. You actually get added harmonics rather than just boosting the harmonics that are already there. And it's that harmonic density that then means that it can hold its own against the harmonic density of distorted acoustic, uh, distorted electric guitars and cymbals. Yeah, it's one of the challenges about trying to make stuff that really rocks is, you know, uh, I know... Back in black, we started our conversation with, but um, mm. but let's be honest. Um, in some ways, uh, things were a little bit easy then because they weren't trying to load so much stuff into a mix as people <laughs> try to do now. Especially if you're, you're yeah. competing. Um, Joe Baldrish was a guest on the show, and he just pointed out that with all these software synths, there's a lot of music that's being made now too that just has so much harmonic density to it that used to be taken up by the guitars, but now it's like taken up by so much stuff in your production. So it's great yeah. to have these tips that you're sharing about different ways to like, you know, how do you keep something forward when you, when you know that the production decisions you're making for your music are right? Like, you know that yeah. guitars are supposed to be distorted. Yeah, distortion on the drum sounds good. We want that too. We want distortion on the bass. But like, how do we get the vocals to be audible by the end? Yeah, yeah. And in fact, you mentioned bass and Parallel distortion on bass is another really good example. Yeah, you know a lot of the a lot of the guitar texture sound that you think you're hearing on rock records is often the distortion harmonics of the bass guitar as much as it is the guitars themselves. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And the thing is, if you um, without doing parallel, if you just distort the bass until you start hearing it in your mix, then you go listen to it. You're like, oh man, what happened to all my low end? You know? Yes. You can just God, kill yeah. the, kill the yeah. natural bass tones. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, very cool. Well, let's let's pause for a minute. We'll come back in for the jam session. Rockstar is a reminder that we're, we've got links in the show notes straight to the blog post, which has all this awesome stuff Mike is sharing with us. Yeah, it's there'll be, be lots of other suggestions in there as well. Yeah, it's going to be a, a virtual plethora, a, a cornucopia of freeware. Smorgasbord. A smorgasbord. <laughs> Wait, is that a German thing? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it's Scandinavian. This is Scandinavian, okay. What yeah, What's yeah. the... So Mike's joining us from Germany. So so Mike, in Germany, <laughs> what is the word that you would use for a big, a vast feast of food and everything? Oh, crumbs. Oh, cr crumbs. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Crumbs doesn't big sound blowout. very vast and feast like. <laughs> it <man. doesn't. laughs> awesome. Well, anyway, we'll come, maybe we'll think of it when we come back. Rock says we'll see you in just a minute okay. for the jam session. You know what it feels like when inspiration hits and you want to capture your great song idea, but then the studio gets in the way and it's just no fun anymore. Wouldn't it feel awesome if you could simplify the process of producing your music from inspiration to final masterpiece? PreSona Studio One is a powerful digital audio workstation that helps you compose your music with a complete collection of virtual instruments for keyboards and drums, MIDI tools for hip-hop, EDM, and film, a flexible sketch pad with 
chord charts and key recognition for songwriting and arranging, and classic effects pedals and amp simulators for guitar and bass. With 37 high-quality effects plugins, integrated Melodyne, and drag-and-drop flexibility, you can easily edit and polish your mixes. And Studio One is the only DAW with a built-in mastering studio so that you can take your record from writing to radio ready all in one place. Download your free version of Studio One Prime and get started now at PreSonus, wherever sound takes you. If you're using a Mac in your recording studio and you're tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly, then Otherworld Computing is the solution for you. OWC can help keep your existing Mac and studio current and relevant so that you can make great music. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM, install an SSD, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac, you can get the most mileage out of your studio with OWC. Offering a vast library of DIY installed videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49, there's no need to get frustrated when you can achieve the speed to create and the capacity to dream at OWC.com. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now. My guest today is Mike Sr. joining us from far across the big pond here. Um, and we're going to continue to dig into awesome free plugins that you can download. So far, we've covered a ton of great stuff that I've, I've, I'm about ready to end this podcast <laughs> interview just so I can go start downloading stuff. <laughs> but uh, Mike, are you ready to jam, dude? I'm absolutely ready to jam. All right. Don't mention any great records or we'll get lost in the game. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what do we want to talk about next? Oh, well, this is actually, this is possibly my favorite little plugin I've discovered. And it is such a, a, a silly little one in some respects. Now, you must have had this, because I mean, you do a lot of mixing, where you get someone yeah. who's recorded a drum kit, and they've got, they've got close mics, and they've got overheads, and they've got kick drum. Mm -hmm. But the overheads are right over the cymbals, and so they, you don't get any snare tone out of them. Oh, I thought you were going to say they forgot to record a snare mic. <laughs> well, no, they've recorded a snare mic, but they've got it right next to the top head, and the the overheads are right over the cymbals. So the only right. snare sound in any of the microphones basically just goes, Dong, and that's it. That's the only sound you get. Yeah. Well, there's a company called Waves Factory who have brought out a plugin called Snare Buzz that will take your top close mic snare signal and synthesize the under snare sound. Oh, wow. And it is brilliant. It is genuinely brilliant. It'll even add a bit of room sound to it. You can decide what kind of uh, frequency range that kind of burst of noisy snare buzz comes in. And it's just, it's so simple, and yet it's actually really effective. I've used it several times now. Just to give... Wait, now, are you, are you saying this is really easier than me figuring out how to route my snare drum out to the live room, <laughs> find an extra speaker, set it on top of a snare, put a mic under the snare, re-record the whole thing, and then try and get it right? Uh, no, but um, I don't think there's a freeware <laughs> snare drum. <laughs> no, there's not. But I mean, I, I'm joking around, but that, of course, is how we used to try yeah, and absolutely. add the underside yeah, yeah. later on after the fact. But yeah, oh, it's, it's such um, well, fun. It's that's great. cool, man. Really, really cool. All right, so will you tell us a little bit more how about how we would use it? What's what's the use? Well, it's exactly scenario. that kind I mean, of situation where you've got a recording where it's it's so easy when you're recording in a project studio not to get enough of the snare tone. You know, if your if your snare mic is closer than about three inches away, then it's just going to, particularly on the top head. You're just going to get head mm -hmm. resonance and you're going to get a stick attack. And none of the like noisy um, snare stuff going on and none of the shell tone to it. And yeah, that kind of, of stuff the, is vital. None of the stuff that makes you feel like yeah. it, it has power. And you know, once you put that in the mix, what your snare sounds like is it just sounds like it's going boop, boop. That's all you hear. Whereas you want yeah. it to have some kind of sustain, and it's that noisiness of the snare wires that tends to help your snare drum sound like it's sustaining in the mix and actually sounding like it's still a snare drum when your electric guitars and everything else are going. And that's what's great yeah, about well, snare Yeah, well, it actually makes it so that it's legible, too. Like, sometimes you feel like you just can't hear the snare in the mix mm. unless you have that power mic, you know, an ambient mic or one that's further away from the snare. Yes, yeah, yeah. 
Um, like if you just try and turn up the close mic more, it just sounds like it's not sitting in the mix. Or if you compress it a lot, it just starts to get too like, sounds like popcorn. Yes, yes. exactly. It's exactly that. It's just, it's just that basically you, you don't have enough snare sound there in your microphones. Yeah. Um, you know, if, you, if, you're, if your overheads are pointing at the, at, the, at the cymbals, which a lot of people's are, the, the snare is kind of off axis and, and quite a long way away and just sounds a bit dull. So you don't get that high frequency sustain. So now the snare buzz plugin, we just sort of duplicate our snare track and put that on the second track or something and it creates that sound? Yeah, yeah. or you can use it as a send effect if you, if you want. But yes, that's exactly what you do. It's a little bit like okay, cool. a snare trigger set, tra- snare trigger track, but it's it's just so simple to use. It's really really cool. Awesome, awesome. Um, well, what else you got? We love drums. Keep giving us drum okay, stuff. We okay. got more of that. Well, drum stuff. Um, I would say that it's useful to have a really really aggressive compressor for drums, and there are quite a lot of like character compressor plugins in the freeware market. You know, you can, it's just one of the things that people like doing. Pretty much the, my first freeware project is do a compressor that has lots of attitude and, and, and like compresses massively. Nice. But one of my That's very great. favorite ones is absolutely, is absolutely the nuclear option from a company called Audio Damage. And it's called Rough Rider. And honestly, this like thing is, <laughs> is absolutely mental. <laughs> it just, it, it, yeah, it like compresses like 50 dB with the most kind of speedy release times and stuff, you can absolutely nail it. It reminds me a little bit of the SSL Listen Mic Compressor, but more so. It's, it's mm-hmm. just, it's absolutely mental. It's insane. So that's Have you tried to get one. that kind of Phil Collins sound with it yet? I haven't tried to do that because I haven't needed to, but it's just useful for any situation where you want to absolutely hammer your room mic, say. I mean, that's a classic kind of case for it. Or if you have, wasn't, or if you have like a mono room mic and you just want to trigger that from the snare to create a bit of snare sustain, you can hammer it into Rough Rider first, and it just creates this kind of sausage of of uh, uh, ambient of snare ambience. That's great. Wasn't Phil Collin known? Wasn't his sound sort of like integrated the uh, the, the talkback mic and the SSL? That's absolutely. I, I what never it was. actually yeah. explored it too much, but I, I mean, I, I, the, the actual history of it, I'm not exactly sure how it was. And in fact, I don't think he was the first person to use it. I think it was actually on a Peter Gabriel record that they first used it. But basically, they just heard the sound of the drums coming through the talkback, um, the listen mic compressor, when they like stuck the talkback and heard from the from the listening mic in the studio what the drums sounded like. They thought, well. That sounds really good. Can we like add that in? And so they just rewired the listen yeah. mic compressor to tape. And that was the basis of that Phil Collins drum sound when it came to doing the Phil Collins record. You know, it's funny because it's exactly the same that I find myself, the same thing I find myself doing here. I'll except I don't oft I don't usually have a dedicated talkback mic. I just take one of the extra drum mics and I squash the yeah. snot out of it so that I can hear what everybody's <laughs> saying when they're playing. Yeah. You yeah. know, in between takes. Yeah. But then it always sounds so exciting. It's like, oh man, I should totally use that in the mix. Yeah. So I've actually, you know, recorded it onto tape. But there's, there's a bit of advice from Tony Platt, talking to Tony Platt. Um, he says basically always record the talkback talk back mic because yeah. it comes in useful <laughs> on lots of occasions. And then Jamie Tate, another guest on the show who's just here again, um, that was one of his things he discovered was uh, just an SM58 pointing away from the drums out at the room, squashed like crazy, and you add that in and it always sounds killer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So groovy. So yeah, I love it. All right, so uh, Rough Rider. We'll squash the crap out of an extra (laughs) mic. And now, any tips for where you might want to put that extra mic, that talkback? Does it even matter at that point? Oh Well, I mean, if 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 it is a genuine talkback mic, you'd put it within kind of a as close as possible to all the people who are in the studio. I mean, the basic reason to have a talkback mic in the, or sorry, a listen mic in the studio is because there are very loud instruments, which means that your microphone gains aren't very high and therefore you can't hear what anyone's saying when you're talking about things in between takes. It's more of yeah, an issue exactly. with like guitar overdubs. Because I mean, with drums, you usually hear people through the room mics or through the overheads. But if you're just doing like guitar overdubs and stuff in the, in the live room, you won't hear the guitarist through his, who there is mics if he's got his Marshall turned yeah. up. So you have the talkback. Yeah, you're right always going to hear the acoustic player, and you're going to hear a lot of the fiddle player. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but 
they're not uh, the fiddle player's not always leading the session. Yeah, and so you do need to. Well, you hear the vocalist too. Yeah, if they're in a booth. Yeah, yeah. well, no one wants to hear the vocalist. And sakes, <laughs> <laughs> maybe not till later. <laughs> If you want to capture every nuance of a great performance in your studio, then you're going to need to start with a microphone that is crafted with great care and attention to detail. Jay-Z Mics and Riga Latvia designs amazing sounding microphones that are handcrafted with jeweler's precision to bring you incredible detail in your recordings. At the heart of Jay-Z Microphones is the unique Golden Drop capsule design, which uses a lighter, faster diaphragm that delivers great clarity and fidelity while avoiding distracting colorations and distortions. This is my voice right now on the new Amethyst microphone with Class A discrete amplifier circuitry, extremely low self-noise, and advanced built-in shock mount technology to bring an expensive sound to your studio for an affordable price. Jay-Z offers a five-year warranty, free shipping to the U.S., and a 30-day money-back guarantee. Plus, for a limited time, you can use the coupon code ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the Amethyst microphone at jayzmic.com. During the height of record making, Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, Stack Studios, Arden Studios, and the New York City record plant all turned to one company to build their consoles. That company is now Spectra 1964, carried on today through Bill Cheney and Jim Romney. The extremely stable, high-speed circuit design of the 101 amplifier provides unequaled headroom, low noise, and linear output irrespective of transient audio peaks, giving you cleaner, punchier, dynamic recordings. Spectra 1964 brings you the sound of ZZ Top, Aerosmith, Bruce Springsteen, King Crimson, John Lennon, and so many more. Created by the missile engineers who are central in rolling out the systems that protected the free world for over half a century, Spectra 1964 literally brings rocket science to your studio. With the STX 600 mic pre with built-in comp limiter, full frequency passive BBDI, and C610 dedicated comp limiter, start making records that last a lifetime time at spectra1964.com. Okay, cool. So, all right, let's see. So, uh, compression, any other drum stuff that's exciting? Any um, any uh, cool freeware reverbs or anything yeah, like that? Yeah, well, I mean, this we can get into effects because, of course, that's another whole area where the freeware arena is absolutely packed is when you start getting to the effects, effects area. Um, it's, it's funny, in, particularly on the reverb, angle, there's a lot of stuff out there that isn't very good in one way or other. Either it's got mm-hmm. not very nice kind of metallic overtones to it, or it does really funny things in mono, or it just, yeah, it doesn't, it, 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 it's, it doesn't sound particularly natural. Um, and I mean, mm. obviously, not natural sounding reverbs are useful in their own right, but finding a freeware reverb that actually sounds quite natural is not that easy. In fact, my top tip for this is one from a guy called Denis Tihanov called Oril River. Again, this is one that I'll have, to, I'll have to put the link in the show notes. But it's just one of those reverbs that can do the natural sounds. Okay, cool. Um, well, you know, you're, you're talking about the free ones mm. uh, sometimes being useful. A free one that comes in Pro Tools, of course, is Dverb. Right. And that's totally one of those examples where there are many times where I've tried to use it, I'm like, it just... It's too boingy and yeah. stuff. And then there's other times where I'll use it and it's just the greatest in your face extreme, yep. like great character yeah. creator. And actually, for there are overdubs. loads of great like statement reverbs like that. I mean, it's so easy to find like freeware spring emulations and funny little strange little uh, old old fashioned style plate reverby kind of things. And that that stuff's pretty easy to find and you're less concerned if it sounds unnatural and how it sounds unnatural because you'll EQ it a lot anyway and you'll it'll be an effect in its own right. It's where it has to sound right, natural exactly. that it's really difficult because then yep. the reverb actually has to be quite well coded. And in fact, from from a perspective of getting natural sounding reverb, the other classic freeware move is to go for convolution. Because you can get freeware convolution engines. I mean, there's a there's a, a, a freeware manufacturer called Melder. In fact, they do a whole range of plugins, freeware and payware. And in fact, their pay their freeware suite is one of the best specified and widest ranging. But one of the uh, plugins that they have, and uh, they do loads of kind of bread and butter plugins. Basically, one of the one of their plugins is a is a freeware convolution engine. 
And then all you have to do is find the impulse responses for it. And there, I think my recommendation would be, there's a company called Samplicity, who have impulse respons responses of the Bricasti M7. And so oh, wow. you can load those ones into your um, convolution engine and get really good natural sounding reverbs for all sorts of situations. You know, if you just got... So... Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, maybe you should explain what the Brocasti is. For those okay, of us. the Brocasti uh, um, M7 is one of the classic, classic big ticket, big studio um, algorithmic reverb processors. It's one of these huge, great mainframe things that has masses of processing in it and is designed to be a reverb that you can design to sound like anything. But it just has a very good reputation for sounding very natural and very kind of warm and nice and not digital, even though it is digital. Yeah, that's great. I believe I heard, um, last person I heard talking about that was probably Vance Powell. Right. Actually. Um, so I wanted to make a comment. I was thinking about what you said about the the realistic reverbs mm. are hard to do. Mm. And it occurred to me that there's probably a simple explanation for that, which is just this. Mm. Um, realistic reverb is something we, our brain has been trained to identify for a lifetime of listening. Mm. And... Therefore, if it's anything short of totally convincing, our brain immediately goes, oh, that doesn't quite sound real to us. Yes. Whereas character reverbs, like you described, where we're creating something that is uh, larger than life or not quite real, mm. we can get away with anything we want yeah. because it's just a character. You know, it doesn't mean we'll like everything we try, but... And there's no clear comparison point. It, it no longer point, has to be there. real. There's no complete, clear comparison point. You know, if you hear a plate, it's not like you're thinking, oh, well, that doesn't sound like the way a, a plate should. It just sounds like a plate. Whereas if you right. hear yeah, a, a room and it doesn't sound kind of naturally like a room, you've heard lots of rooms before that you can compare that to and you have that kind of, like you say, that, that oral memory of it. Yeah, yeah. Now, I guess if you're trying to recreate something that does need to remind you of a, a famous record you loved or something, mm. then yeah, you might go like, oh, that doesn't sound real mm. like mm. it. Um, but that's interesting. Cool, man. All right. Uh, any other cool? What about delays? Oh, there must be some well, I've, delays got, I've got a top tip for you here. In fact, two. Um, one of them is from a, a developer called Musical Entropy, and it's called the Spaceship Delay. And it's like it just already. a great all rounder in in terms of having you know it's got ping pong in there it's got like analog tape style delay it's got you can kind of filter the delay there's various feedback options there are various effects you can apply to it it's just something that gives you a massive range of delay sounds with very with a very kind of straightforward control set it's a really good just yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of an everything delay like, like that, but it's kind of fun and useful and it's very easy to, to get lots of cool sounds out of it. That's awesome, man. I can't wait to try that. And the other one is um, more what of about a kind analog? of character Does it have a, like an analog does, yeah. delay emulation? It has a kind of a tape style um, option, I think, as one of the, one of the uh, kind of, it has various uh, preset delay options in there, as different sounds that it has. I think it has bucket regain, I think it has tape, I think it has digital and... And of course, then that can, it affects the way then 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 it responds when you change the, the delay time. Can you comment on why a bucket brigade delay or an analog delay sounds a little bit different from a digital one for the rock stars? They're just it's the way in which it tends to feed back on itself, and as it feeds back feeds back, it loses some resolution every time it feeds back. Is the biggest thing I would right. say. But also because when you change the uh, time parameter, it changes the pitch. You kind of get these kind of pitch swerves. So you can create kind of special effects doing that. Right. All right. If you have an oscillator, yeah. slow oscillation yeah. on it or yeah. anything like yeah. that. Okay, cool. So sorry, you were well, about no, to mention um, another, the other one another one. is a really cool non-standard delay by um, a developer called Ursa DSP called Lagrange. And it's, uh, I, I'm kind of pronouncing it French, but it, that looks how it should be pronounced. Lagrange, I don't really want to call it. Um, and it's, it's uh, I think it's uh, billed as a granular delay. And it, it just creates a whole bunch of delay-like, it's kind of on the boundary between delay and reverb and phasing and flanging. And it's, yeah, it's just like nothing else. And it's just one of those great things when you go, yeah, I just really need some wacky delay effect. Plug that thing in and off you go. I usually need a wacky delay effect. It's really, really, really good. 
You know, one of the things, again, about effects, especially when I'm doing vocals, in the same way that, you know, um, a parallel distortion on the on the vocal can bring the vocal forward mm. in a way that was hard, was difficult to hear yeah. before that, you know, if you just EQ'd it, yeah. um, and bass. I find the same thing with effects. I find that if, uh, delays in particular on vocals, mm. sometimes they need to have like that kind of distorted, driven, um, filtered effect for me to sit them back in the track but still hear them, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, the thing about, it's a kind of a psychological thing, I think, as well, because the more a delay sounds like the thing it's a delayed version of, you know, the more the repeats sound like the dry signal, the more they tend to blend together, the more difficult it is for your ear to pull them apart, and so the more they tend to draw the dry signal back into the mix. Whereas mm. the more different they sound, the more distinct they remain from the dry signal, and the more the dry signal can remain up front, despite you having a delay on the, on the track. It's brilliant, dude. Brilliant. And so that's definitely, I mean, that's why I love a lot of those kinds of delays. And it's indeed why, why almost always EQ delays and reverb returns um, in, the, in a mix down situation because you, you don't want them usually to pull everything way back into the back of the mix. Um, so if you're going to EQ a reverb or a delay return, mm. you're usually going to, this is a situation maybe where you're doing a send from the main track yes. and then there's an augs return with the reverb on it or the delay on it. Where does the EQ go? Do you like to put the EQ before the the reverb and delay or after? Yeah. Or does that not matter or should we just experiment? I'm sure it matters, but I never bother thinking about it usually, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> um, nice. it's, it's the kind of thing that, yeah, I mean, I almost always tend to EQ after the delay or reverb. Partly because my first step in setting up one of those effects is usually to listen to the reverb or, or delay on its own and just to assess its character and what I like about it. And then that leads me to think, oh, this has got too much mid-range or this has got too much low-end. Or when I move it back into the mix and it begins to make the mix sound muddy, I go, oh, I've got to get rid of that frequency. Or if, yeah. I'm, if I'm hearing the delay too much and it's sounding a bit too obvious as an effect, I might take some high-end out of it. Or if it's making the sibilance spread all over the, the mix from the vocal, then I might de-S it. You know, these, these are all things that I do in response to the way the effect adds to the mix in, what, in, in however I'm using it. I like that. And that's a good reminder um, that, you know, sometimes things don't matter. Sometimes things happen because of the process in which we're just addressing things as we go. Mm. But I guess like, you know, I think you were just pointing out, if you put an EQ before one of these analog delays, then yeah, maybe maybe like really boosting a frequency is going to kind of crunch it out into that analog sound in a different way, which could be cool too. Yeah, yeah. And certainly you can combine um, uh, reverbs and delays with distortion. That's definitely something that I, I would do, or a tape emulation. Yeah, exactly. Now, I guess one thing to consider um, uh, when you're going to use like an analog tape emulation is a lot of times they will introduce hiss, analog tape noise. Yes, they can do. And so if you start putting distortion after it or compression after mm. the tape emulator, you're going to also amp up the noise mm. in your track. Yeah, good point. And if you put it before, you might keep the noise floor down and stuff. Now, those analog... <coughs> tape emulators and the noise and even just the the old compressors like the the CLA classic compressors mm. that have noise added to them boy those can really <laughs> they can bite you later when yeah. you go to print your mix and you start heading towards mastering if you're not careful and paying attention to that cuz you know back in the day mm. when you're mixing on an analog desk you learned to be very careful about muting all the channels until you needed them, yeah. keeping your heads and tails super clean to keep the noise out. Yeah. Um, and if you forget to do that in digital world, you know, you can start a song and with a quiet intro. And by the time you amp it up in mastering, you've just got like shh going yes. on or a yeah. buzz or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't hear it till you have to work out fades and stuff. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So watch out for that and crank up your headphones and check your heads and tails. Mm hmm. Okay, uh, where do we want to go next, Mike? Well, I mentioned this uh, Melder, the company Melder. And it's worth coming yeah. back to them and just saying that there's, they have a really large suite of uh, freeware plugins. And like I said, there's quite a lot of bread and butter stuff in there, but there are some favorites of mine in there as well. One that I use all the time is one called M Stereoscope. All their plugins begin with the letter M. M Stereoscope. And it's a freeware vectorscope plugin. 
And I don't know whether your, your uh, right. rock stars know about vector scopes, but they're a really useful way of visualizing the stereo image of things. Um, educate us. Um, Bring us up to speed. It's a kind of a display that kind of puts the left channel level and the right channel level on different axes of a graph. So you get this kind of circular moving blob. And in practical terms, what you'll see is that if, for example, something is mono, you'll just get a line right down the middle of this graph. You won't get a blob at all. If something's stereo, you'll get some kind of a blob. As the stereo width gets wider, the blob will kind of get wider and then slowly flatten out until it's kind of almost like a horizontal line. If it's like mm -hmm. one-sided, the blob will kind of be veering off to one, one side of the, of, the, of the display. So it gives you lots of information about the way the stereo image works, even in situations where you can't necessarily trust what you're hearing through your speakers. Or if your ears aren't symmetrical, in fact, as well. Yeah. Well, sometimes your room's not as symmetrical as you wished, you know. Yes. Imagined that yeah. it is. Yeah. Um, and that reminds me, of course, of, uh, you know, using a... Um, uh, oscilloscope, you know, one of the first things that was really exciting to do was put in your X and your Y axis left and right and get what they call a Lisa Zhu yeah, pattern. and that's exactly what a vectorscope it, is doing. Yeah. It's just a question it's, it's of the way the... It's such a cool the, way to see it. Yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's a lovely thing to look at, but it's also just really useful. It's also useful just like for practical things. Like I do a lot of um, the formatting of multitrack projects to put into the multitrack library that I have on my site. I have this freeware multitrack library. Um, and I often get sent stereo files that only have mono information in them. And that's immediately obvious from looking at a vector scope display. Because mm. you can tell whether it's... Yeah, good point. You can tell the difference between it being absolutely mono and being just a slight bit of stereo width to it. It would be hard to describe in one sentence what gives records a legendary sound, but it would be easy to describe in three letters, API. For more than 50 years, API Audio has created large format consoles for world-class studios. Famous for co-founder Saul Walker's circuit designs and the original 2520 op-amp, the sound of API consoles is the sound of great music. API now brings that legendary sound to your home studio with The Box, a small format console featuring the famous API circuitry that is the perfect analog addition for your digital studio. The Box gives you eight recording channels on the left with built-in mic pre's, high-pass filters, direct inputs and custom loadable 500 module slots, and 16 summing channels on the right, or mix using all 24 channels, including aug sends, inserts, and silky smooth faders, feeding a master section with classic API compression, switchable monitor sends, and a pro talkback switch, and you've just upgraded your studio to legend status with The Box from apiaudio.com. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Rockstars of Drums will show you how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Want to start mastering your own records? Rockstars of Mastering walks you through exactly how I mastered my own record using nothing but plugins in PreSonus Studio One. Want to learn how to create a mix that doesn't suck but rocks instead? At Mix Master Bundle, I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins so that you can have punchy, powerful drums drums, guitars that rock, bass you can feel, and a mix that is in your face. Plus, it's totally free as my way of saying thanks for listening. Then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started for free now and look for the clickable link in the show notes below. Very cool. So in other words, when people are bouncing out files from mm. a logic session, mm. for example, they might be exporting stereo files for every mono file that was in the session originally. Mm -hmm. And so you end up with something that where the, it's got a left and a right, but it's actually just identical. Yes, yeah. I also find yeah. it really, really useful when tracking in a live situation because any situation where I've got a stereo pair of any type, you can often find it difficult to judge in whatever unfamiliar environment you are, particularly because I do a lot of recording on location, exactly how wide the stereo image is. And it's almost impossible mm -hmm. to judge on headphones. But the vector scope display, you can judge how wide the stereo image is or how much kind of de uncorrelated stuff there is in the stereo image of a stereo pair just by looking at the vector, vector scope display. You know, if it starts to oh, get... That's, that's great. If it starts to get a bit too flat and beyond a kind of a, just a straight circle, you're beginning to think, no, I'm going to have monocompatibility problems with this. It's going to be too wide. Interesting. So, um, 
you know, looking, I think for, for the rest of us, if we just looked at that display, we'd be like, cool, I see a display. And now what do I do with it? So mm. what are some ways that you trained yourself to know what looks right on the vector scope so that you can recognize yeah. it visually right at the beginning? Well, it's quite, um, it's pretty much the same with any analyzer. In fact, even spectrum analyzing things, you have to learn how they respond to stuff that you know. So I would always do it on the basis of using reference material. Stuff that you know is well recorded or commercial releases, looking at how they look on a on a vector scope display. It's useful then to yeah, compare so your stereo image to someone studio. else's. Yeah, back in the studio. So you can see how it how it responds. Also, just listening to recordings you've done and seeing, for example, what their mono compatibility is like. You know, punch your mono button and see what happens to your stereo image. And compare that to what you're seeing on the vector scope. You know, if you see that a certain sh uh, shape or width of vector scope display is has a good enough monocompatibility for your needs or, or is not monocompatible enough, then you can adjust what you do on your next recording session to match a certain width of vector, vector scope display so that you have the monocompatibility you need. Brilliant, man. So here's what I'm thinking. Uh, well, so first question is, does the M stereoscope actually let you take visual snapshots of the, the stereoscope? Uh, you could just take screen grabs of it. Yeah, that's what I was going to recommend yeah. too. So Rockstar's... Yeah. If you're on a Mac, Shift Command three um, will just take a screen grab of your whole screen, and Shift Command four would let you, you know, draw a little box around it. And then if I get, I don't know how useful it is to to need sort of like more of a video reference of it, but you could just use QuickTime and, and mm. grab a little screenshot of something playing back, so you got your own little library of spectroscope yeah. images. Yeah. Okay, cool. Great, man. The other great Am I wearing you out yet? No, that's fine. <laughs> the, the other great one, the other great ones in that set are all the modulation ones. There's they've got a tremolo, a phaser, a flanger, a uh, an auto pan, uh, I think an auto filter as well. All of them are free. And the great thing about the Melder stuff is that the um, capability to modulate them is extremely advanced. You can do just about any modulation curve you like and adjust the kind of phase of the left and right channels according to how you want to create whatever stereo width you want or how you want it to work with the tempo of your mix. You can tempo sync the, the modulation waveforms. So it's, they're just really, really good um, bread and butter modulation plugins for situations where you want to create rhythmic effects or where you want to create like stereo widening or chorusing or whatever it is. So that's definitely one oh, of the so you could you can have the auto pan and the tremolo and and even the phaser and the flanger all sync right to the tempo of the session. Oh absolutely. And in fact you could you could set up a step sequence to trigger them. You could do all sorts of stuff. I mean they're tremendously complex, the Melder plugins if you want to get into it. The the freeware okay. the freeware, freeware modulation ones are pretty easy to use off the bat, just by twiddling the controls that are on screen. But one of my criticisms with the Melder stuff is that you can find yourself getting a bit intimidated by all the little scrogety controls tucked away in little submenus and stuff. But if you, yeah. if, you, if you kind of push on past that, actually the whole family of freeware stuff that Melder do is a pretty amazing deal. They have some tremendous stuff in the freeware set. It's really, it's pretty, okay. I'd say it's pretty unmissable if you, want, if you want just, yeah, a huge range of really good plugins. Okay, great, wonderful. And then will these work straight in a Pro Tools session, or do we have to use a wrapper um, to use these? It's a these good ones? question. I can't tell you off the top of my head. I know it's both Mac and PC, and I know it's 64-bit. So Yeah, it, I think it does work, because I think I've had ML Audio in there before, and, and I hate to admit it, but I think I was a little bit scared by them and, and didn't end up using them as deeply as you're suggesting, so now I'm going to have to go look again. Yeah, but they're, they're really very, very cool. They're extremely well-specified. Okay, awesome, awesome. And then, um, you know, here's a question. Yeah. You know, somebody might be asking, well, if they're giving away all this stuff, like, what's uh, what's the business model for? Like, what oh. what do they sell? Are, are they trying to, you know, get you to buy another plugin when when some of these companies give you a free one? What you what what, do you've we need got. to know anything about that? Well, I mean, a lot of these people, honestly, a lot of these people are actually just making freeware plugins. Some people just do it as a kind of a... Yeah, or either kind of a, like a public service or just for fun just because they like doing it. A number of the oh, ones so cool. I've mentioned today um, are ones where either they have a whole load of other plugins in their range that you can also get if you want. Like, for example, Waves Factory, the people who do snare buzz, have another great plugin called Track Spacer that is payware. Or Klanghelm, who do the Ifki 2, they have mm -hmm. all sorts of, they have a, a lovely kind of Fairchild style compressor. Um, Tokyo yeah. Dawn, the the uh, Katelnikov and Nova and things, they all have like advanced versions of the freeware 
plugins that have extra facilities and extra flexibility and extra um, presets and things. Um, so they, a lot of them have that business model, but they don't really kind of shove it down your throat. And in fact, generally, I try and stay away from recommending plugins that are too obviously trying to sell you something straight off the bat because I just find it tedious. Yeah. And, and if they have tremendously yeah. involved like installers and stuff, it's like, I, you know, no one wants to have to install 15 bits of software on their computer to install one bit of freeware. So I try and avoid that kind of stuff if I can. Yeah, I, I get frustrated by the ones where um, maybe they won't let you not see the ones that are for sale. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so that you're trying to like pick a plug in and then everyone you try and pick, it's like, oh, you need to go yeah, buy this one. Yeah. Like, oh, well, on, I mean, Melter are very good because they have an installer that will install all their plugins with all the non, with all the payware ones on demo, but you don't have to install all of them. You can just install the freeware ones if you want. Very cool, very cool. And they do have um, a right, load so of very, very cool plugins in addition to the freeware ones. They've got like something a little bit, kind of a drum leveler one that's great. They've got lots of really oh, cool. cool multiband processing. Oh, those are the those are the uh, the payware. Yes, yeah. Upgrades, cool. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I think a lot of us are probably happy to buy some plugins, but it's great to know that um, all these free ones are out there. Plus, uh, you're mentioning so many cool new ones that I've never heard before. <laughs> so, good. Rockstar, I just want to remind you too that uh, before you you know try and reach for the dashboard and take notes, uh, just don't worry about it. Just drive safely, or you know. Um, you know, if you're, if you're, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know. Maybe you're, maybe you're a dentist <laughs> and you're listening to this in headphones while you're drilling somebody's teeth. Um, we'll, we'll include ne- uh, these links in the show notes yeah. so you don't have to worry about taking notes during the episode. Um, cause there's just so many that you're listing, which is awesome. What do you want to talk about next? Is there anything, do we want to take our, you know, let's, let's get on the bus, take us to the stereo bus. Anything we need to know about just the mix bus and uh, picking the right freeware plugins. Are there tape tape emulators out there for us? There was a very good freeware tape emulator called Ferox that was done by a guy called Jerome Bribart. I don't know if I'm pronouncing, pronouncing his name correctly. He has since um, uh, founded the company Tone Boosters, who do a whole bunch okay. of different plugins, but they are they're all extremely affordable, but they're not free. And okay. in fact, the best tape emulator, or the, the best kind of affordable tape emulator I know is the kind of successor to Ferox, which they do. It's in their bus tools bundle. In fact, that's one of the biggest plugin bundles I can recommend. I think I re- recommended it in the last episode too. Um, their, I think their bus essentials uh, bundle has this tape emulator in it. It's called Real Bus. And it's brilliant. Really, really good. And it's, it's like $40 for a set of six plugins, which includes my favorite um, uh, Dynamic EQ and my favorite uh, DSA as well as this thing and a bus compressor emulator too. And that's the plugin manufacturer is called Ferox. No, the, the plugin manufacturer is called Tone Boosters. Oh, sorry, Tone Boosters. Yeah, and it's their bus. bus I think it's called Bus Essentials. Um, that's great bundle, and it's it's brilliant. Yeah, I'd, it's an absolute no brainer. If you've got any money to spend on plugins, that's where I'd probably spend it first. I'll wait till we're done with the interview, though. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Do you feel like the time you spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks, and tweaking version after version of your mixes has gotten you nowhere? Have you been looking for a simple, straightforward, step-by-step process for creating a pro mix that won't take years to learn? What if you could have a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all your mixing struggles and could coach you through them? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is just for you. Now you can discover the proven step-by-step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Here are just some of the things students are saying about the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass. Absolutely the most informed Formative and helpful block of information and mentoring on the mix process I have ever been a part of. That was like sitting behind a mix engineer for years, watching and picking up tips along the way, condensed into a six to seven hour lesson. David P. Thanks for a great session, dude. Just when I needed the inspiration. John F. A true feat of greatness. It was really life-changing and worth way more than I paid. Mark R. I've literally watched it two times at length, taken a plethora of notes, then combed back over some sections even 
even more. You guys really knocked it out of the park on this one, and it was so incredibly eye-opening and useful immediately. What else can I say? Shane J. Amazing masterclass with Craig Alvin. My biggest takeaway was the concept of adding a subtle combination of distortion and compression to achieve a buttery cohesion in the sound. But there is so much more. Steve K. Listen, I appreciate you listening to this podcast, and I know you're trying to make your best record ever. But when you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy-winning quality, then you're ready for UltimateMixingMasterclass.com. Okay, awesome. Um, why don't you talk to us a little bit about uh, just a, just conceptually what what's a, what are some good tools to consider putting on your stereo bus? What are some nice ways to assemble a few plugins so that you start, you know, exploring some cool sounds with your mix? Well, I think for most styles, you're probably going to want some kind of compression on your mix. And I think if you don't have access to anything that is uh, more specialized, you generally kind of a payware option, then you could do a lot worse than use something like Kotelnikov. That's a pretty, mm -hmm. that's a pretty good all-purpose compressor. Um, and again, it's cross-platform. Yeah, that will probably be my first, my, my easiest recommendation for that. Um, you're probably going to want some kind of EQ. What, what you'll normally find when you're mixing is that you'll develop a mix, and then once you've got a full mix kind of sound, you'll start comparing it against other commercial stuff, and you'll think, yeah, I've maybe just got a bit too much low mid-range. And rather than going mm -hmm. onto all your individual channels and turning down the low mid-range, you might as well just take a bit of low mid-range off your, off your bus. And there... I'd I'd probably look at something like um, either the linear phase one, again, because it, 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 it kind of does no harm in some respects and you're just adjusting the frequency range without anything else, or experiment yeah. maybe with, one of the, with some of the ones that have a little bit more of a sonic character to them, like the Sonomous or the LKJB ones that I mentioned earlier. Um, in, addition, in addition to that, what you might consider is adding some kind of gentle kind of tube flavor to it. And uh, this is, there's a developer called Voxengo that do loads of really good plugins, a lot of very good payware plugins. They have a freeware one called Tube Amp, and that can do some nice, subtle, like, tube emulations that just can warm up a mix a little bit. That's worth definitely worth Seems trying. Seems almost counterintuitive. You know, you think about a tube amp, you're thinking about, are people going to imagine running it through a guitar amp, they'd be like, why would I want to do that to me? Is that <laughs> the wrong way to think about that one? Or are you just a little bit. I mean, using if you're, it in a if very you're, subtle I'm, way? I'm using it in a very subtle way. And it just, it also depends whether, if you want to make any distortion um, processor more subtle, just run it in parallel. It's another thing you can do. It basically right. run it as a send effect alongside your master bus. Um, that's definitely, definitely a way forward. But I think the, the okay, combination cool. of like EQ and compression and some kind of saturation or coloration you might use, maybe a tape emulator if you like, um, that, that's, a, that's a good basic set of things that you might want to do on the master bus. Now, where would you put the, the tape emulator in that chain of effects? It's a good question. Um, I, think I, would probably, I think I would probably put it after the other two. Fundamentally, I think I would probably drive the um, uh, compressed version of the mix into the tape, treat it like it was a master tape, and the EQ. So could, and then the EQ. It just depends on how I've, what order I've done things. I mean, if you're getting a kind of a noise problem, but, but I mean, yeah, I suppose it depends on the kind of um, tape emulation you're using. Usually, most tape, tape emulations will let you decide how much noise you have, so it's not really that important where mm -hmm. you put the EQ. I mean, you're not going to be doing massive yeah. EQ anyway. If you are, you've got your mix wrong. Right. And then, um, you know, the, the noise feature of plugins for, for tape emulators is usually you might have to, like, click a little deeper, you know, into the menu. Yeah. And then you discover that, that you can just simply, you can turn the noise off yep. if you want yep. to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you might miss it. Yeah. Well, I mean, see, there's a control for it in, in real bus in the, the Tone Boosters one, which I, I tend to use. Um, yeah. Cool. All right. And then uh, what about limiting? How important is it for us to, you know, kind of make this stuff loud and proud? Well, there are, there are a few things that I tend to try and avoid using while I'm doing the actual mix. One of them is multiband dynamics in a, as a general rule because there's a tendency if you put multiband dynamics on, a, on your master bus 
because they're quite fiddly and quite, um, it's critical exactly how you set them up. Um, when you start changing things on your mix, it begins fighting what's going on with the bus compressor. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, you can find it very easy to start chasing your tail from a mix perspective. You think you're doing one thing on yeah. your channel, and then it's starting fighting something you're doing on your bus, uh, your, on your multiband bus processor. So I tend to leave all that kind of stuff to a separate stage. You know, when I get to the point where I'm referencing my mix against commercial mixes, at that point maybe I might go, well, might I need to apply some kind of multiband thing to 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 make my mix work against the commercial mixes? But I wouldn't really want to be dealing with that while I was while I was doing the mix itself. It just gets it's a psychological thing apart from anything. Yeah, I mean, one of the things you're describing that I've run into when I try and add too much stuff to the stereo mix bus is I might keep pushing the snare, keep pushing and be like, yeah, it's slamming now. And then you turn the stuff off for a second and the snare's like 6 dB louder than it needs to be in the mix. And you're like, oh, whoops. Yeah. You know. Well, I mean, with a full so, band compressor, that's part of what you're doing a little bit. I mean, the sound of r most rock mixes is the sound of the drums being a bit too loud and the compressor struggling to put them back to back into balance. That's pretty much right. the kind of <laughs> pumping effect you've got. But but there's a difference between doing something like that and doing something multiband where it's, it's doing something a lot less um, uh, natural to the ear. And it's, it's, it, it, you can, you right. can end up with quite a flat sounding mix. If you if you if yeah. you start using multiband processing at, at the mix stage, and it's actually the same with the limiter, I tend not to have a limiter on the mix bus while I'm actually mixing. Again, when I'm referencing, if I want to make a more decent comparison between my kind of unmastered mix and a commercial release, yes, I might see how it responds to limiting, but I'm not going to mix with the limiter because yeah, you begin to start messing with yourself in terms of how you're EQing things and how you're, how you're automating things and just generally how the dynamics of the mix work. It's very easy to basically yeah. push it into the limiter and think you're making it sound, making it sound better when you're mixing and it, it's just yeah. making it sound a bit louder or a bit more dense. Y yeah, I, I like the processes in the studio where you find things where if you work this way, it, it forces you to kind of work a little harder for something. For the mm. result, you, you can often end up with a better result. Mm. Definitely. You know, whether it's whether it's just simply getting the sound right out of an instrument before you record it. Yes. Or whether it's, you know, not making stuff, not putting the limiter on to cheat your way to loudness at the end. Yeah. But, but try and get the mix itself to kind of come to life before you yeah. add that last step. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, we've gone from, uh, we never talked about kick drums. Was there anything at the kick drum? I was going to say kick we went drums. from the very <laughs> bottom of the mix to the top, but... uh was there anything cool for kick drums? Well, I mean, there are um, plugins that will kind of simulate a sub kick sound. I think for a, for a kick drum, and yeah, the funny thing is, I very rarely feel the need for that with most kick drum sounds. Normally, it's more a question of controlling the low end than adding any more that wasn't there in the first place. I mean, the, the number of times I get um, drum recordings sent to me that have a, like a sub kick track, and I pretty much just throw it away because <laughs> it's it's just going to make the low end a mess if I try and mix it in. Um, so with kick drum, it's a little bit less the case that I would use it. Something like a dynamic EQ might be useful if you want to add more attack in the kind of lower mid range, where if you just tried to EQ it, it would make the mix sound woolly, but you want it to have a, a kind of a punch to it, and that's the same in fact on snare too. You put a, some kind of a, a dynamic EQ thing in there that will just momentarily boost the level of the kick or the snare drum whenever there's a hit, and then pull it down in level again, so that the so that the um, resonance of the drum doesn't doesn't have that same EQ on it. It can give you that. Mm -hmm. It can give you a bit of punch without it making it kind of sound woolly. So that that can be mm -hmm. quite useful. There's nothing nothing specific I'd think about. I mean, there, there are things that are not freeware that I find myself using on 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 kick drums. In fact, a definite um, a recommendation I would have for for, for payware plugins is something called Entropy EQ by Sonable, which mm -hmm. is brilliant for kick drums and indeed snare drums that are too resonant in one way or another. I mean, you know, if you've got like a a, a, a rock track that is high tempo, high energy, and the kick drum just sounds a bit flabby and kind of rolling bass going on. Well, with Entropy EQ, you can take out all those pitched elements from the, from the kick drum and be left just with the transient part of it. And it can be okay. absolutely phenomenal what it can do in terms of turning a kind of flabby, round-sounding kick drum into a really tight kick drum, almost as if you've taken the front head off the kick drum. 
It's tremendous what it can do. But anyway, that's, that's, it's a bit of an aside because it's not a freeware. But uh, there's definitely a top tip in terms of specialist uh, plugins. And it's, that's something currently I found no freeware alternative to currently. Now, is that sort of a transient designer kind of thing? And, and no, it's, are there free versions of that as well? There are freeware transient designers. I found a few of them, but there are none that really, I kind of think are really special or indeed that, that, that are cross-platform. There's a nice one from a, a, right. a like a PC one from a Sleepy Time DSP called Transient. That's quite well specified. There are ones that are cross-platform, but there's nothing that, as I was going through the freeway, I thought, wow, that's really exciting in, in the way I did with some of the other ones I've, I've, I've mentioned so far. Okay, groovy. I yeah, mean, again, with pretty much every one of the types of plugins you can think of, um, if you want a whole bunch more suggestions of like different EQs and compressors, whatever else, there's a whole bundle of those on the site and I've just kind of cherry picked the ones that I most like super cool well um, then I guess we could probably cut to the chase here and uh, let Indeed. the rock stars know where they can go find the stuff and learn more about you and, and we'll kind of wrap it up Indeed. Yeah. Well, I mean, all of these uh, recommendations, uh, I've had a lot of these recommendations, I wrote up little articles about on my um, Patreon site. They're kind of free to view articles. So you can head over there and <coughs> have a look Have a look at those articles there because it's a bit more background on the individual plugins. Um, there are links to these and a whole bunch of other ones on my book resources site. Um, and all those links, again, I can put in the show notes for you. Fantastic. Mike, what a pleasure hanging out with you, man. Thanks so much for joining us on Recording Studio Rockstars and giving us all these great insights and tips. Always a pleasure. Um, yeah, man. I'm just like, I've got two pages of notes here. It's just so many <laughs> great things. I'm going to, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be downloading for the next, for the rest of the night, you know. Um, again, thanks for being here. Uh, Rockstars, thanks for listening. And uh, if there's any more, do we need, need to, uh, did you mention your website? Uh, yeah, the website is www.cambridge-mt.com. Okay, great. And we'll have that link in the show notes as well. Uh, Mike, thanks again for being on the show with us. Um, let me, Anytime. you know what? I'll ask you this one hypothetical yeah, question, which away. we've, we asked you a different version before, yeah. but um, this is taking this, the way back studio mm -hmm. machine and, um, you know, you're going to go back and I don't know how far you're going to go back, but you're going to find a younger Mike who's mm. looking for some free plugins and trying to figure out how to mix better. <laughs> and you say, listen, dude, here's the one bit of advice I want to give you. This is the single most important thing for you to know to be a rock star of the studio and particularly of the freeware mixer. Okay. Um, one day. What advice would you like to go back and give yourself? Okay. The thing that means you can mix on freeware is that your hardware is any good. Just if you get your monitors sorting out, sorted out, that's what means you can mix on freeware. Simple as okay. that. You know, that, that's... Because you, need, you yeah. need to hear what you're yeah. doing. Yeah, if, you, if you've got money, spend it on the hardware. That's one of the reasons I'm so hot on freeware software is because I want people to spend more money on the monitoring hardware because that's where, that's the bit that means you can mix. And it, that's the bit that make, makes it not matter if you're just using freeware. And have you designed speakers that we can go buy yet? Well, funnily enough... Um, I have a, a like a podcast for my patrons on my site, but just this last episode of the podcast I've made freely available publicly because I reviewed the uh, Neumann speaker system that I was so excited about that I had to tell everyone about because it is brilliant and it's about, I think, $1,500 or $1,800 for a full range system. That is just oh, tremendous. Cool. Um, and so, yeah, okay, I, can, I can include the link for that in the in the show notes as well. But yeah, it's a free free podcast review that I did of that. That's great. That's great. Well, um, Mike, thanks so much for being here, man. A pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right, man. We'll talk to you soon, dude. I, hopefully, we'll uh, we'll be having a pint together at one of these next co conferences. Indeed. <laughs> Look forward to it. All right, man. Cheers. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my 
my free course at MixMasterBundle.com. And if you want more free content from Recording Studio Rockstars, all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email. Again, that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates, and even free gear giveaways for your studio. Just look for the link in the show notes below. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks for being a rockstar. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who helped make this episode possible. OWC, Jay-Z Microphones, PreSonus, Spectra 1964, and API Audio. You will find links to all these wonderful sponsors in our show notes. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. So thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.